Okay, I'm going to call this meeting to order. And at this time, we'd like to call on uh, our Restream Fellow for the National Anthem. Oh Thank you to the McKay Choir. Uh, at this time, uh, Council, if we could take a moment and uh, share some words from Regional Councilor or Regional Chair Jim Bradley regarding the passing of Councilor Sandy Bellows. On behalf of Regional Councilor, Council, it is with great sadness I share news that Regional Councilor Sandy Bellows passed away. Councilor Bellows was a valued member of our Council, and her presence will be missed in our meetings and by her friends, family, and constituents. Councilor Bellows dedicated her life to the people of Niagara and was a fierce victim rights advocate. This advocacy saw her serve as a keynote speaker for many government and law enforcement agencies, including conferences for the Ontario and Canadian police chiefs, hostage negotiators, and American law enforcement agencies. In recognition of her work in this area, Councilor Bellows was invited by Prime Minister Harper to the Victims Bill of Rights ceremony in 2015. Councillor Bellows was a highly respected St. Catharines resident where she volunteered with numerous community organizations, bringing her experience and expertise to these positions. In 2018, Councillor Bellows was appointed as a commissioner on the Niagara Parks Board of Commissioners. Additionally, Councillor Bellows held board positions with Niagara Grape and Wine Festival, Crime Stoppers of Niagara, St. Catharines Minor Hockey Association, Vic Teal International Tournament, and May Court Club of St. Catharines. Councillor Bellows took her responsibilities as an elected official seriously and effectively carried out these duties with integrity. Even while Councillor Bellows courageously battled her illness, she continued to attend regional council meetings and assist residents with their concerns. 
Her absence will be felt across the entire Niagara region. Our thoughts are with Councillor Bellows' friends and family as they mourn this significant loss. Can we ask for a moment of silence, please, Council? Thank you, Council. We thank Chair Bradley for his kind words, uh, and I don't think I could have put it any better. I think he hit the nail right on the head, and this truly will be a loss to our Council. On to item three, proclamations. There are none this evening. Adoption of the agenda. If I could have Councillors Bagu and Kaleloff move the agenda. Any questions? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. That's carried. Any disclosures of interest? Thank you. Approval of the minutes. We have the regional meeting. Regional meeting. A regular meeting of council from September the 27th of 2021. If I can have councillors uh, Wells and Bodner move that. Are there any questions to those minutes? All those in favor, please raise your hand. That's carried. At this point, Council, I have these following items to be raised this evening under Staff Report 7.1, 7.2, and 7.3, under Correspondence 8.1, 8.2, 8.3, 8.4, and 8.5. Are there any other uh, items under Staff Reports, Correspondence, or Item 16 motions to be lifted? Seeing none, if I can have Councillors Beauregard and Demeray move uh, the items not being lifted. All those in favor, please raise your hand. And that's carried. At this time, we have one presentation this evening. Uh, Carolyn Ryle, Director, Transportation Services Division, and Frank Tassone, Associate Director, Transportation Engineering from the Niagara Region, Transportation Services Capital Projects, five-year overview. There we go, the camera's zooming in. Carolyn Frank, welcome this evening. Hi, um, Mayor Steele, how are you? Very well, thank you. How are you guys? I'm great, so you can hear us clearly? Perfectly. Great, uh, good evening. Thank you, um, City Council, for uh, having uh, Frank and I here this evening. I also just wanted to introduce uh, Pam Miltonberg. Um, she's with us as she plays an instrumental role in the coordination of the overall capital budget and she's assisted uh, Frank and I this evening with the presentation. So between the three of us, if there's any questions, um, we'll, we'll be able to address those after the presentation. So I just wanna say thank you, first of all. Um, I'll start off the presentation just by giving a little bit of an overview as to a couple of the topics that we're gonna be addressing this evening. If you wanna to move to the next slide, Pam. And then what I'll be doing is anything to do with regarding upcoming capital projects, um, I'll pass it over to Frank and then I'll close with uh, safety initiatives and uh, the regional vision. Uh, the intent really for us uh, coming uh, before you this evening is to, just to give you an outlook as to how we work uh, with your staff there on our one to five year capital forecast for works um, in Port Colborne, as well as our 10 year outlook, which is what we're going to be presenting tonight. So just to refresh everyone a little bit on the region's um, capital budget process, which we're in the midst of uh, right now, uh, there's four main areas that transportation brings forward as part of our uh, draft capital program. We look at network expansion, intersection improvement uh, program, the roads rehabilitation program, and then our structure rehabilitation program. And what I decided to do was just to provide a little definition here so everyone is aware of what each of these different programs entail. Uh, network expansion has to do with the construction of a new road or the widening of an existing road. 
It's associated with um, growth and development uh, throughout the region. And it is identified within the region's transportation master plan. So transportation here at the region talks quite a bit about uh, the different projects and how we put together our outlook to 2041 with regards to, uh, T, uh, uh, with regards to programs in our transportation master plan. And that's what drives a lot of the network expansion conversations when we're budgeting for the capital program here at the region. Another program uh, as part of our capital program has to do with intersection improvements. Um, this will do with um, an upgrade to a signalized intersection. It could be the replacement, so we're rebuilding an intersection. There could be safety concerns that have been identified as part of our annual program or something that's come forward from the community. Uh, we take a look at um, the installation of turning lanes if required. Uh, we'll install uh, new AODA uh, features to the signalized intersection. Um, and we also, as part of that program, for example, would look at a roundabout. So it's not just a traffic signal. We also take a look at uh, roundabouts and how they can be implemented in different contexts and in the different communities. When we talk about a roads rehabilitation program as part of our capital program, I think what everyone is most familiar with is our hot mix program. So this is increasing the longevity of the road uh, network in the sections. So we've got a program that we bring forward under hot mix every year can range anywhere between nine and 12 or 13 million, depending on the capital year. And we target the roads that we're able to increase the longevity as already mentioned. And then we're out there um, repaving those sections of road across um, various uh, regional, regional roads throughout the, each of the municipalities. And then lastly, we look at structures. Um, this could be the bridge rehabilitation. So these are modifications, alterations. This, these are improvements that we're making to the bridges to extend the service life or to deal with the, uh, the load carrying capacity of a bridge versus a full bridge replacement. So that's when the bridge is at its end of service life. And then we're budgeting to do a full bridge replacement, um, which has obviously a lot more dollars associated with works related to that. Great pitch. It's okay. I'll pass it over to Frank now just to give an update onto the one to five and six to 10 year forecast. Okay, thanks Carolyn and uh, thanks council for having us tonight. Um, so there's a few projects that we wanna discuss in the uh, one to five and six to 10 year capital forecast. And uh, we're gonna start with uh, regional road three, Main Street East from highway 140, the Barber Drive. So this section is uh, coming up for renewal We'll be looking at doing a full road reconstruction through this section. And when we do a full road reconstruction, we always include buried infrastructure upgrades, illumination upgrades, and platform upgrades to ensure that we accommodate active transportation through that section. So that is currently sitting in our one to three year forecast, and we'll be moving forward with, uh, with that project uh, as soon as funding becomes available. Uh, we are currently out working on Wilhelm Road from Highway 3 to Forks Road. This is a six kilometer stretch of road that is undergoing a hot mix resurfacing. There is also drainage improvements that are being taken care of as part of this project. So we're uh, you know, dealing with any deficiencies in the culverts that cross that road section and then taking care of any re re uh, repairs to the base asphalt and putting a, a fresh wearing course on the top once we're completed. And then in the six to 10 year forecast, we have a structure in Port Colburn that is going to be rehabilitated, just Townline Road Bridge structure, uh, which is just, um, just I guess, so, uh, I guess that would be north of Townline Tunnel Road. And I'll pass it back over to Carolyn now to uh, discuss some safety initiatives. Thanks, Frank. So there has been quite a bit of dialogue here at the region with regards to um, safety concerns and different initiatives that the region and transportation have been working towards. Um, you've all heard, I'm hoping, uh, the Vision Zero Road Safety Program. Uh, there was conversation as early as this morning at uh, Public Works here at the region on timing to get the program rolled out. Uh, we're anticipating the launch of the Vision Zero program uh, to start in 2022. Uh, prior to it being launched, and that will include red light cameras and automated speed enforcement in community safety zones, 
uh, will be coming before uh, council again um, uh, to require, we require actually an approval from your council with regards to intermunicipal agreement uh, changes that we're gonna be proposing in order uh, to roll out the program. So we'll be coming back, we're targeting the end of this calendar year. If not, we'll be coming into January where we'll do a presentation around uh, what's in, what's entailed under the Vision Zero Road Safety Program and then what the proposed changes are through the intermunicipal agreement, um, looking for support and the approval ultimately to, to launch the program in 2022. Um, it's a program that we're very excited to get up and running and again, bringing the red light cameras as well as the automated speed enforcement to the communities, we think is gonna have um, a very large impact on the on driver awareness and uh, changing driver behavior, which is something um, there's been a lot of dialogue uh, with many counselors with regards to, for example, speeds on the road. So this is something that we know will make um, a large impact once it's, it's rolled out in each of the communities. Other things that we've been doing in the interim, still under the safety initiative program here at the region, uh, is we have an annual pavement uh, line marking uh, program. So we're out uh, um, annually doing uh, upgrades with the painting of um, the lines, the turning signals, the arrows. Um, something that we launched this year had to do with doing a durable uh, crosswalk program in the bottom photo there that you can see there. So right now we're out targeting um, high pedestrian intersections through this very small program to get it off the ground this year where we've applied a new material, which is durable. And then the intent would be to continue launching that throughout all of the region with another set of crosswalk uh, locations, again, based on large ped volumes um, starting next year again. The speed display trailer is another item that um, based on inquiries or requests or concerns we're getting um, at the region with regards to speeds, even though speed does fall under the jurisdiction uh, to be enforced by the Niagara Regional Police. We work very closely with them on this program. You can see, you can see again the diagram of the speed uh, limit there at the 55 uh, flashing the speed. So we will pull the trailer out into the area of concern that's being raised to the region. We're able to record the speeds and at what time they're happening. And again, in partnership with the NRP, we provide that information back so that we can work on selective enforcement to help deal with the speeding concerns that are being brought forward. And then lastly, anything to do with sign installations, anything to provide, again, awareness around crosswalks, pedestrian crosswalks, um, you know, air brakes, anything to do with just safety, improving it, but more importantly, providing driver awareness. Um, all the requests come through our safety group here, and then we work to implement those out in each of the different communities. And then lastly, just to touch on a couple uh, regional visionary items, just uh, to make sure everyone's um, informed. Uh, the region did receive prior approval on a program uh, related to complete streets. Uh, this program is currently under a way, it's consulting assignment. So the region has a consultant on board who's been working with a large stakeholder group for the last year. Uh, the stakeholder group is comprised of not only regional representatives, there are also are representatives across each of the different 12 municipalities that sit um, on the stakeholders group. The intent of the program is to look at the different typologies of the regional road network, so everything between an urban cross section down to a rural, to classify the regional road, and then to put sort of a toolkit, um, a list of items together that talk to what would be the traditional or the items that we'd want to see, uh, we'd like to see implemented across each of those different typologies. So the diagram there that we show at the top is probably the easiest one to, um, to, to talk to is the urban cross section. So when we're identifying a regional road in an urban cross section, we'd be looking, for example, on, um, uh, we'd be looking for uh, active transportation would be a key element. There'd be the, uh, the coordination with the municipality on sidewalks. Um, we're having extended conversations as part of this um, coordination work around multi-use paths and cycle tracks now, in addition to on-street bike lanes. We're looking at different landscaping treatments and what those boulevards could look like um, with an enhancement in lighting, for example. So there'll be more to come on this complete streets uh, approach on what we'd like to roll out across the regional road network. We're also taking a look as part of this larger assignment and how we transform the regional road network, not only to be car centric, but also to be more multimodal. So you can see the signs there where we wanna have people using transit. 
We want to have people to feel safe riding their bike or walking, pushing a stroller. So it's not just so uh, the roads are being designed strictly for cars. They're, they're, they're anticipating many uses on the road. And again, how do we do that safely and being able to get everybody between each of the different municipalities? Uh, next steps include um, a continuation of those dialogues with the 12 municipalities. Uh, we're going to be moving into roles and responsibilities, for example, on uh, who would take the lead uh, implementing and then the operational costs associated with that. So there's still a large piece uh, of the program that we need to work through with um, our colleagues at each of uh, the municipalities. And then the intent would be to bring that back to public works and ultimately council where they would be provided an update and a presentation of the final product. And then we'd be looking for approvals in bringing this forward. So it's actually an excellent piece of work that has collaboration going on across all the 12 LAMs. And again, it's, it's going to be something that, you know, when we're designing these roads and we're ultimately building them, everybody is aware of the different items that they can be used throughout their municipalities um, to get these different features and these, these different items that we've all been wanting to incorporate. Uh, next on the list, we have the, uh, the regional wayfinding program. So this program has not started yet. There's no funding associated with this. This will be the next uh, program that we're going to bring online once the Complete Streets program is done and approved. We're hoping Complete Streets will be done in 2022. So uh, the next budget year, we would put in consulting dollars for regional wayfinding. Um, you can see the picture to the right there that's got the different um, colored signs. Again, we would have a stakeholders group that would uh, work across all the different 12 municipalities. Again, we'd be looking for ways to move people across the regional road network in a consistent manner um, to direct them to historic and other uh, destinations. Again, working with the different municipalities on preserving you know, the, the different heritage features they may have, but also keeping it somewhat consistent to get everybody again from the regional roads into each of the different municipalities to uh, to the to the special destinations and locations, um, the Hamilton the Niagara Hamilton Trade Corridor. Again, this is uh, an instrumental piece of work. It's a very big program. It was identified in the region's transportation master plan that was approved. Uh, this is a piece of work that will need to be done in many stages. Uh, the region has been working uh, with MTO. Um, and the provincial and the federal levels of government on different submissions for some initial funding to start phase one of this program. This is looking to do um, an, a, a redundant or a second um, highway network that would go from the QEW and Fort Erie all the way to Hamilton. And the importance for this is again, everyone's aware of just you know what happens on the QEW from a congestion standpoint, but more importantly, from a trades movement, and if there's ever an accident, we'd like to have a different uh, network available to be moving, again, people in goods throughout Niagara region. So there's a lot of work uh, still to be done on this program. Uh, it's been something the region has been talking about for years, um, and we're hoping to get some initial funding sometime soon, at least to start the first um, planning phases around this program. And then lastly, we've got the Niagara Scarpment Crossing. This is uh, another uh, piece of work that was identified in the region's transportation master plan. Um, this is uh, the new um, north-south escarpment crossing that would run through uh, Grimsby um, up Bartlett. Uh, we're looking to start an environmental assessment process in 2022. Uh, we've been working with the Ministry of Environment on the terms and what this may look like. And uh, this would be about, uh, uh, it's gonna be about a three year environmental assessment process due to the size and scale of this. And then again, um, the importance of speaking about this with each of the different 12 municipalities, as well as uh, the regional body here is the funding requirements to get something like this lifted off the ground, uh, which would be beneficial to all municipalities down here in the region. And again, it's just more of um, keeping everybody aware and then any opportunity to talk to the different levels of government to assist the region on bringing such a large program online um, is strategic and also very important. So those are the major highlights um, from Frank and I this evening. We're happy to um, answer any questions you may have with any of the information we brought forward here this evening. And I also just wanted to say thank you for your time. We appreciate uh, being here. Great, Carolyn, appreciate it. Uh, questions from council? Councilor Bruno. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Nice to um, finally see a face 
that associates with Carol's name, Carolyn's name. Um, I have to tell you um, that the residents of Ward 3 and those along Main Street were um, thoroughly pleased before and after the fact the work you did at uh, and expedited it through Councilor Butters at Main and, uh, and Elm, and it has turned out as good or better than, uh, than was promised. So thank you, Carolyn, for that again. Um, appreciate that. I, I wanted to uh, now direct um, my question towards the year one to three and as it pertains to Main Street East. I recall a couple of years ago that there was what was then a one year delay on pushing through on the Main Street East project. And from my calculation, that one year delay um, would bring us into construction in 222. And I'm just wondering if you could comment on that because I hadn't heard anything in the interim um, that that project was being pushed further. I, I recognize that you said subject to budget, but I thought you may have your 222 already um, done and dusted. If you don't, maybe that gives me hope, but what can you tell us about Main Street East start of construction? Um, uh, through the chair, uh, thank you, Councillor, for uh, the question. Uh, so all of the different programs uh, that we bring forward are subject to budget approval. So thank you for noting that. Um, I can say that this was a program and a project that we did we did put forward as part of the 2022 capital last year through transportation at the region. Uh, due to the very sizable uh, budget uh, that we did put forward, this project was deferred when it was assessed uh, across a number of different variables. Um, we will be putting it back in for reconsideration in 2022. Uh, the intent is we've broken this project out similar to other projects uh, across three phases. So we're going to start with the design piece of work. Then we'll move into any property and utility relocation subsequent, and then the final construction, which is the year three when we talk about how we would start and finish the program. So it is on the region's radar. Um, we will be putting it back into 2022 for reconsideration uh, with the hopes that we'll be able to get it started. Yes, thank you for the uh, forthrightness of that. I, I guess I'm I'm seeing that Main Street East needs to get on the CAA's list and hopefully my fellow councillors or citizens will do that if that gives us any impetus. I, I'm disappointed, though, in this sense that, that that looks like even the property acquisition and some of the planning um, has not even started. So, so where, in the in the best case scenario, when would that construction be? Uh, through the chair, so we're estimating uh, 2025. It would be moved out to 2025 construction starting and again that's all pending if we get capital budget approval next year to start the design work in 2022. Okay well I have to say I think we're probably all disappointed in that but I mean I know we there is a packing order. Port Coburn doesn't have a lot of regional roads and so I, I think that um, you know there's a tendency to uh, to think that um, um, we would like those few roads to be in great shape, but um, uh, I'll leave that to our regional representative and, and mayor going forward. I'm not sure, Mr. Mayor, if I have or if uh, Carolyn can entertain any of the issues associated with the maintaining of the current regional road uh, network, boulevards, et cetera. I know this presentation was meant to be the capital plan but I didn't know if while we had her here, if we could discuss any ongoing issues. Um, well, that's not what the presentation was about. So <laughs> I'm getting a nod here from my clerk <laughs> to stay on point. Um, maybe we can have Carolyn back with regards to that to actually sure. tackle those issues because she is here for her presentation. Sure. If that's okay. I think you know some of those ones with the... Uh, um, uh, certainly sweeping and uh, grass yes. along our regional roads, but I, yes. I can defer that till later. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank Good. you, Carolyn. Thank you, Councillor. And, and, and both the CAO and I have met with the uh, 
with the interim CAO, who's now our permanent CAO, so we can meet with him again now that he's permanent CAO, and we were in discussions uh, with regards to looking at some uh, sharing of some responsibilities with regards to that, so we'll, we'll bring that back. But we can bring Carolyn uh, in for that. But Carolyn, just, just on a note with regards to Main Street East, you, you heard me at the meeting uh, a week and a half ago with my feelings on that and, and Councillor Butters uh, very disappointed in that not coming forward when we uh, we agreed uh, quite a while ago to not well I guess a couple of budgets ago that uh, we were going to you know hold back and for the good of the team we would take it for a year and that it would be back in 2022 but unfortunately I was unable to make the um, the budget meeting last week due to the fact that I was in the middle of negotiations with the Niagara Regional Police as Police Services Chair and also uh, my mom was in the hospital in emergency procedure so I couldn't make that meeting but I, I'm just not sure Councillor Butters and I have been playing phone tag over the last little while um, so when you say the money isn't there with regards to so far that still doesn't close the door for Councillor Butters and myself to bring that forward to regional council does it uh, through the chair so my understanding Mayor Steele is that um, uh, I, with the pending upcoming council, I think there's always the appetite as part of that process to have it uh, raised. Um, I can tell you that uh, Councillor Butters did raise it um, last Thursday as part of the levy conversation, um, and it was not approved or, or moved forward that evening as part of that discussion. Um, so I'll leave it um, to yourself uh, and Councillor Butters with regards to next steps on how you'd like to continue to bring that forward. Uh, but it was brought forward as part of the levy conversation last Thursday, as were other um, projects. Transportation was a very big conversation that evening, and um, uh, a number of them did not uh, did not uh, they weren't brought forward. Okay, thanks. I just need a clarification on that. So thank you. Yeah, no you. problem, uh, Councillor Bruno. Uh, thank you, Worship. I'm sorry, I forgot this at the time of asking your question. Given that delay, but given the optimism that you've expressed with wayfinding and complete streets, is the silver lining for our weight mean that wayfinding and complete streets can be incorporated in our build? What I don't want to find out is, well, in 2000 and 22 we or 23 we started the property acquisition in this and the wayfinding didn't get quite complete so it would have been great if it would have had to i mean you know it sounds like you're starting up another program that could benefit main street east now i'm worried after these delays that um we could possibly catch a benefit in wayfinding. Can you speak to that at all? Carol? Uh, through the chair. So the what's advantageous, I'll talk about complete streets first. What's advantageous about complete streets um, is that we're we're looking just to formalize what's already already happening in conversation with transportation and each of the municipalities, in particular when we're going down through a main street, because those are very um, uh, they're very commercial, they're important, strategic, obviously, areas. Uh, we often are restricted, for example, on the width of the platform and the available space. So a lot of conversations are underway, obviously, in how we can strategically incorporate, you know, the sidewalks, the nice boulevards, the active transportation components, you know, the parking that may exist and if we're keeping it or not. So all of those conversations are already happening as part of all of our designs when we're when we're working with the municipalities um, on a regional road. Uh, what's important about complete streets is now we're putting a list, a toolkit together that everyone's agreed to, and where we can uh, afford it, and where we have the the maximum space, and if we will and we can include it, we're going to work to include it. And everyone's now on the same playing field of understanding what the different items are because we've all agreed to it even with regards to cost and responsibility, because that's another item we're going to be um, just confirming as part of the complete streets. So it's fair to say that that toolkit should be ready um, by, by the time we're launching um, the street that you're referring to in Port Colbert. The wayfinding is something, again, that we'll be moving towards 
from my lens, that's something that we can implement, even if it's after the design and construction of any regional road, because it's going to be dealing with, again, strategic placement of signage and how we want to move people through the corridor. So that's something that we can always implement after the fact. Obviously, our intent is to come forward with um, an operating ask for those consulting dollars. We'll be doing that. If approved right after complete streets are done, again, targeting the end of next year, we hope to transition into that. Um, but for your awareness, wayfinding is a very big program on rolling that out, similar to complete streets. It's going to take us some time, but that's not that's something we can work to implement after the fact if need be. Councillor? Just on that, I'm cognizant of the fact, though, that some of that wayfinding it may need, if not property acquisition, it may need, um, you know, uh, not easements, but what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, conduit, things things like that. And so, whilst maybe not impl implemented, can it be um, implemented ready with the infrastructure? Uh, well, we have regard to that in the design. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so through the chair. So sometimes, uh, so yes, there will be there will be conduit, and there will be other provisions made throughout the corridor. We do it already. When it comes to strategically having things maybe at the location of where wayfinding may go, it's fair to say that won't be something unless we have a line of sight, for example, in working with the municipality that they have a strategic, for example. Um, corner you know on the way into for example the main street that they want to have highlighted we can make special provisions to secure whatever we need to for that and that'll be a part of the conversation through the initial design process implementing something from a from a wayfinding perspective or requiring property or electrical those sorts of things again if we don't have it that's something that we're easily able to work towards, whether it's through an easement or a property negotiation. And again, it's all pending available location and, um, and what we're strategically talking out there. A lot of the wayfinding doesn't require electrical. You can see it's just um, posts with decorative signage, different colors potentially, different sizes and variations to direct. Um, but there are often, when you're going on to main downtowns that they want special features, that will be something that we'll, we'll talk more strategically through the design period, um, not so much during wayfinding. So we'll be able to capture that with the municipality as part of that conversation for sure. Thank Councilor? you. Okay. Great, thank you. Uh, Council Borgard. Through your worship to Carolyn, in regards to uh, bike lanes being created, uh, how do will you work with our local municipality in creating more of a um, interconnected network of bike, lane, bike lanes, or would you just work on the regional road and it'll be up to us to kind of figure out whether or not we connect you know, a bike lane to it or, or not? Carla? So through the chair, we we typically concentrate on the regional road network. However, it's not to say that we uh, are not aware, for example, of trails or other infrastructure. Uh, that are in the close proximity of the regional road network. Uh, the region does have a bikeways master plan that was approved as part of the transportation master plan. It talks to interconnections, which are municipal roads with the regional road network. And there is a funding program. Um, Pam, is it 200,000? It's 200,000 that's been approved in previous budgets where we give um, dollars associated with uh, those interrelated uh, active transportation uh, uh, projects that have been identified. We work with the LAMS on providing some of that funding so that as we're, for example, doing the main street, if they have an interconnecting road and they want to bring that forward, we help support that through some additional funding. And then they'll work to bring that online in concert with the region as we're doing our program. So that's a program that's in effect right now. Um, it's again every annual uh, budget process. There's an approval process for those dollars, and again, it's it's to fill in those gaps and to increase the network where we can. Councillor, okay, through your worship, I would just hope that staff would be uh, looking towards uh, getting those dollars when the time comes. Thanks. Great, thank you. Any further questions? Seeing none. Again, Carolyn, thank you and your staff for coming out this evening, and we look forward to our next regional meeting with regards to the budget. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Great. you so much. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Thank you.
Okay, on to um, item 10, uh, delegations. This evening we have Jesse Bowles, chair of the downtown BIA, request to string Edson lights in downtown Port Colborne. Uh, so we'll have Jesse uh, go through this and then we have Mr. Kalamoto who would, uh, has uh, more information on this. Jesse, welcome. Good evening, thank you very much. Uh, simple one for council tonight, we think. Um, as part of our BIA mandate, you all know that beautification is part of what we do and we're looking for ways to brighten up downtown. Um, this is not a unique idea to us. We're absolutely stealing it from downtown St. Catharines. I've spoken to their um, chair, uh, their um, executive director for their BIA and they're, um, they're excited to, to uh, see us hopefully do this as well. Um, there were pictures included in your council package for a visual aid. And what they've done is they've taken those strands of Edison lights that are become very popular these days and they've strung them lamppost to lamppost throughout the downtown core. Um, they're done in a way that they're up high enough that they're not impeding any walkways or driving or trucks or anything, as well as they're up high enough to be semi vandal proof, I guess you could say. They're, they're beyond the reasonable reach of somebody with a stick. Um, we're looking to do the same thing in downtown. We've gone ahead and purchased 150 strings of them or 3,750 feet worth. It should be enough to cover the areas um, most prominent in the downtown through West Street, Clarence, King, Charlotte, Catherine area. Um, we're looking to basically do this in any of the areas where you see the, the lit up um, um, the boats that are the LED boats that we have lit up and and the decorative lampposts. So we're we'd be tapping off of that power to uh, to, to create this look. Um, the lighting that we've selected is commercial grade, and it uh, it's got a warranty on it. It's got weather certified connections on it. Uh, we have a, a stock of spare light bulbs. We are. This is something that we are looking to do totally of our own cost, including covering the installation maintenance, as well as the hydro bill. Um, the beauty of today's um, modern technology with LED is very rough numbers here, and, and the director of infrastructure services can can um, can verify this with me. But uh, based on what we're looking to put up, we're we're actually looking at only about, um, an electrical usage of about three hundred dollars worth of hydro for the entire year. Um, with LED coming as, as far as it is, but in any case, we're, we're willing to reimburse the city for that. Um, these lights would function on the existing photo cells that are in place, and the only um, labor and cost on the city side would be for um, the maintenance of those, of those electrical outlets that are already up in the posts um, that they are maintaining along with the photo cells that currently power the street lights as well as the, the boats that are out there now. Uh, our goal with this is to leave them up year round. Um, a conversation that Chris and I have had, and we've had at our BIA table, and I, I know Councillor Kaleliff and I have talked about this at length, is we have very much an inconsistency in terms of our downtown lighting. We have multiple fixtures and we have multiple styles, and we have issues here and there with things working and, and not working on and off. So we're, we really like the, the idea of of brightening up and giving our, our downtown a, a glow and uh, making it look more warm and welcoming throughout the evening. And especially through the winter months, we think this will really liven things up and brighten things up. Um, we do have some dark spots and corners. Um, this kind of goes as the, the first step to our, our rebranding and our, and our um, downtown beautification goals. We are talking and looking at doing Kind of a three seasoned approach to things so uh, one of the one of the feedbacks that the public gave us last year was we were very much void of of christmas cheer um, through the uh through the christmas season last year i know we did get those led lights up with in conjunction with ourselves uh, the main street bia and with the city's contribution and those certainly brighten things up and give us a nice look and effect um, there were people that were confused and thinking that those were our idea of Christmas decorations, which of course they're not. We are leaving them up year round. But uh, in any case, um, I, I can confirm that we will be giving the public some Christmas decorations this year and things will look much more 
festive and lively. We're we're currently um, obtaining quotes for for live greenery and 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 garland on each of the lamp posts throughout the downtown. So we will be maintaining that and looking to do other things as the seasons progress. We of course have the beautiful flower baskets that we do through the summer, but we are looking to do that for for the holiday season. Um, but we do think that these lights certainly will give us that that small town hallmark movie charm and feel that that lends itself so well to our downtown um like the mayor said we have spoken with um with director kalamoto and he's given us the the list of requirements and and what we need to do to be in compliance with with his requirements and with city requirements including uh, having a licensed contractor install the lighting um, the maintenance of it, um, a design standard of, of, of maintenance. Um, he said that we need to decide at which point we'll be out there replacing light bulbs and make sure that we maintain that as well. Um, obviously the quality of the lighting and the fixtures that we, we select, um, but we are totally on board with all of his requirements and we're actively looking for a contractor that could install this safely. Um, the, the actual install would be between stringing um, uh, a cabling between post to post and then the lighting would hang off of that so that it wouldn't actually be suspending by its wires. Um, again, this is all LED and it would, they can connect up to 15 strings per, however, we wouldn't be anywhere near that. So they would be tapping off of each of those outlets and running on the photo cells. So they would run dusk till dawn. And again, we'll cover the hydro. We're just looking for council's blessing to, uh, to go ahead and uh, brighten up the downtown. Great, thank you, Mr. Bowles. Before I go to questions, council, I'm going to go to Mr. Kalamudu. As I said earlier, and as Jesse has indicated, they have uh, met on this just uh, with regards to moving forward and having Chris being our point person on this. Mr. Kalamudu. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, uh, Public Works and staff are fully supportive of uh, the BIA and this endeavor. Obviously, the BIA will be hiring the contractor. Uh, and have a municipal consent, which would include the normal work from heights, liability, WSIB, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, hold the city, uh, have an indemnity for the city to hold harmless. Um, again, staff are recommending that uh, they stay out of trees um, just because of the potential damage, which uh, Jesse just did mention going from pole to pole only. And the BIA would be responsible for any of the maintenance of the repair of those lights. So. Um, the city would not be doing any work, just helping um, facilitate uh, this, this project being done. Um, as uh, Mr. Bowles mentioned, uh, there would be a maintenance level of service. So it may not be just one light that is out and then re repaired. It may be a multitude of lights, just again, because of the cost uh, for replacing of bulbs and fixing of uh, strands. So, and again, uh, Mr. Bowles mentioned that the BIA would be responsible for any of the electricity costs. So, with uh, certain stipulations that uh, that uh, Mr. Bowles and I uh, went back and forth on, uh, staff are fully supporting uh, this project moving forward, should council wish to do so. Great. Thank you, Mr. Kalamu. Any questions to Mr. Bowles or staff? Not seeing any. Great. Thanks, Jesse. Oh, I apologize. Uh, Councillor Beauregard got in under the wire. <laughs> My, my apologies, through, through your worship to actually Director Kalamoto. Um, in the event of a storm and any of these lights were to fall or, or cause damage to any property, who would the city be liable or the BIA? Mr. Kalamoto? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, that's where the indemnity clause may come in so that it would be, it would not be the city that would be liable from any issues that arise from that particular uh, strand of those lights of infrastructure. And that may be something that we would have to work out with the BIA uh, with regard to sort of a quasi mini agreement with regard to that to have a whole harmless clause. Councillor? Oh, okay, so do we need to request that an agreement be made? Like, do we need to add that into a motion? Or how, how would we proceed with that? We can, uh, based on what Mr. Kalamoto said this evening and based on their uh, meeting so far, uh, Mr. Kalamoto has put a, a good series of, um, of uh, uh, things that the, uh, the BI must adhere to based on uh, best practice through uh, the city. So I think if we let Mr. Kalamoto lead this, uh, he's Quite frankly, he's got all the bases covered on this one. 
Okay, I'm just not sure. Do we need to create a motion, or because I don't see a motion before us in this necessarily? We can uh, we can move to accept the delegation and uh, give a direction to staff to proceed based on uh, the conversations they have and the agreement that Mr. Kalamoto and the uh, BIA will be putting together. We can that that we can do. So, okay, thank you, Good. thank you, uh, Councilor Bruno. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, just a big thank you to Jesse and the BIA. I mean, just in the last year when I see the uh, uh, the ship lighting, um, the market initiative, now this, the proposed garland. I mean, uh, well done to you and your group. And thanks for all that extra effort. You all do that as volunteers and to our staff for, uh, for interfacing that. But um, really impressive. Uh, thanks very much. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Any further questions? Seeing none, I'm going to have Councillors Baggio and Clayloff move that we receive the delegation this evening and that we direct uh, Mr. Calamoto and his staff to put together the agreement between the City of Port Colborne and the BIA based on their uh, uh, meetings and what may come forward uh, with regards to having this um, project move forward. Any questions? All in favor, please raise your hand. That's carried. Thank you. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Okay, Council, we're just getting into the Mayor's report. Uh, Ontario continues to pause its exit from the roadmap to reopening. Ensuring you get vaccinated is more important than ever. Visit Ontario.ca for vaccination locations. A reminder that you must show proof of vaccination to enter certain businesses and recreation facilities. Please ensure you carry this with you. If you need assistance in getting a printed copy of your vaccination report, stop by the Public Library and they can assist you. Please watch our social media pages for complete updates as we receive them from the province. And at this time, it will still be important for you to wear a mask and maintain social distancing. Staff are continuing to offer customer service supports for residents, businesses, and visitors by phone, email, website, and social media channels. If you have questions in regards to City Hall services or would like to report a concern, you can contact a customer service representative Monday to Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. by calling 905-835-2900 or emailing Customer service at porkoburn.ca. Alternatively, you can visit our website, www.porkoburn.ca, and submit a service request or inquiry by clicking on the Request a Service tab located in the top right corner of our website page. A reminder that I'm still looking for help from the children of Port Colburn with the design of the 2021 Christmas card. The contest is open to all children who live or go to school in Port Colburn, up to and including those in grade 8. I would appreciate all submissions be received at my office at City Hall, 66 Charlotte Street, by this Friday, October the 15th, 2021, at 4 p.m. If you're dropping off your pictures, please knock or ring our new doorbell uh, at our front door, or you can drop it in our mail slot on the front east side of the building. We ask that you print your name, address, and telephone number on the back of your picture. Hockey is back in Port Colbert. On Saturday, October the 23rd, the City of Port Colborne will be hosting a university exhibition hockey game at the Valley Health and Wellness Center between the Brock Badgers and the Windsor Lancers. Tickets are being made available to Port Colborne minor hockey players, and a limited number of free tickets will be available to the public. The Valley Health and Wellness Center is a facility that does require any adult 18 or over and any youth 12 plus that are spectating the event to be fully vaccinated and provide proof of their vaccination status along with photo ID to gain access. Wearing a mask or face covering is also required inside the Valley Health and Wellness Center as per the Niagara Region face covering bylaw. Children under the age of five are not required to wear a mask or face covering. And if you would like to participate and attend the game, watch for details coming to our website in the next couple of days. And that'll also be coming on social media. One thing about this game, uh, counselors and those watching from home, the head coach of uh, Windsor is a very good friend of mine. And when he called me with regards to Windsor coming down to Niagara, uh, they wanted to actually stay in Port Colborne. Uh, the original two games were scheduled for St. Catharines. Uh, so he and I put our heads together, had the bright idea of, hey, if everything's okay, let's bring it to the Valley Health and Wellness Center. We've hosted some great um, games in the past, our sledge hockey uh, men's uh, USA versus Canada game, which was uh, a packed house. 
We've had uh, international women's uh, teams represented here uh, in Port Colborne. So, you know, this is just another uh, great event that the public can come out and watch. Again, there are a numbers issue with regards to our facility. So please keep an eye on our on our on our uh, social media with with regards to how many tickets we we can uh, allow in there. Um, but I would like to thank uh, the Marsh family for donating their cottages to host uh, the Windsor hockey team. So they're coming into Port Colborne and they're going to stay here uh, on that weekend. It's going to be a retreat for the team as they uh, get ready for their season ahead. The unfortunate part about uh, this year is the fact uh, because of COVID. The university teams are in an east-west uh, division, um, so Windsor won't be coming to Niagara uh, like they normally do uh, and play a couple game series against Brock during the regular season. Uh, they'll be staying in the western end of uh, Ontario and playing the universities down there. So we will be walking them here, so uh, for those around town that see uh, the guys with their Windsor outfit on, just say, hey, welcome to Port Colborne, and, and we're coming out to cheer uh, both Brock and Windsor on. I think it's going to be great entertainment for the city. And we look forward to hosting, especially the minor hockey kids that are coming out and watching those guys. And to be quite honest, guys, university hockey is fabulous. You have many of those players that are coming off of junior A careers, some even off of semi-pro careers. So uh, it is very good hockey. So we welcome everybody that we can get into the facility. And again, please keep an eye on our website and our social media. With that said, that's my mayor's report. Any questions? Great council. Um, Regional Councillor, uh, Regional Councillor Butters sends her regrets this evening. She's unable to attend. If there's any questions, I can take those tonight, or you can email the Councillor or myself, and we'll take those uh, forward to the Region. Any questions to the Regional Councillor? Seeing none, perfect. We're under staff remarks. Staff, is there any information to come back to Council? Nothing in here. Staff online. Anything? Not seeing anything. We're going to Councillor's remarks. Councillor Clayliff, I'm going to start with you this evening. To you, Mr. Mayor. No, I'm good to done. I don't have anything. Everything's been answered that I wanted to know about. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Councillor Wells. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I have two items. Um, the first item is that um, I shared this with uh, Director Kalamoto earlier. Uh, and I understand he has been discussing it with the CNR, and that is the poor condition of the rail crossing at Brookfield Road and Forks Road. And um, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Director Kalamoto for uh, enduring the the, um, the trial and efforts to to get the CN to respond to it. Uh, maybe uh, if uh, Director Kalamoto can give us an update, that'd be great. Sorry, Director Calamoto. Through you, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, to the councillor and, and anybody watching. Um, actually, the mayor and I were out there several weeks ago uh, noting the condition of that uh, particular crossing um, just south of Forks on Brookfield. I did reach out to the 2CN uh, multiple times, still waiting to hear back. I have offered a multitude of meeting dates. Uh, unfortunately, some of them were not uh, responded to and some not responded to in time. So I do keep um, keep going after um, the workers there at, uh, at CN, their representatives to uh, have a meeting on site so that we can show them in person the kind of condition that their crossing is. Thank you, Mr. Kalamoto. And I think that was August we attended that location based on a call from a resident in the area. And uh, we may have to pump this up to my office to um, get a letter off to the president of CN with regards to our meeting that we had through the CAO and I back in, I believe it was July, Mr. CAO, somewhere in there. We had a meeting with the president of CN and he assured us that uh, they would be very responsive to our requests. Uh, so uh, Mr. Kalamoto will give you a week to see if this uh, individual gets back to you. If not, uh, the CAO and I will look after getting in contact with the president and making sure his staff get back to you. In a timely issue because you're correct that crossing isn't uh, in the best and quite frankly councillor wells it's not that old it, it was repaired less than 10 years ago so uh whoever did the repair for them didn't do a very good job uh, i think that was mr kalamoto's <laughs> comment when we were standing there so uh, uh councillor wells go ahead 
Yes, one, one of the issues has been that crossing has seen an extensive amount of heavy truck loads and, and the road just south of that has actually collapsed and been repaired as well. So um, I just think the, the caliber, not, not so much the quality of the road repair, but the, the uh, caliber of that road repair uh, crossing was probably didn't account for the, the types of trucks that was, would be expected over that. So, but I appreciate uh, if you can raise that, uh, uh, Mr. Mayor, and I thank uh, Director Colomoto for all his efforts and trying to get that resolved. Um, my uh, second dish, uh, remark is that um, there's been some exchanges of emails and communications in regards to some of the parking and no parking signs, particularly the May to October 31st uh, parking on the beach end roads. And I just wonder, uh, I would just like to go through you, your worship, to Director Kalamoto, uh, if he could clarify um, exactly what is being done there and uh, when we might expect to see, um, uh, there were some discussions with regards to a map identifying what parking would be where uh, as to when we might receive that. Mr. Calabota? Uh Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor. Uh, Councillor, we, uh, Public Works staff did work and actually have the map uh, that we thought was completed today. Unfortunately, again, me being new, I was not aware of certain amendments to some of the bylaws, so therefore uh, I have to go through both those, a uh, few of those amendments and uh, restructure some of that, uh, that mapping with the help of our GIS technician. Um, so we will continue to work on it, although we thought it was uh, completed today. So again, um, now that new information has come to, to, to light uh, and provided to me, I will have to ensure that uh, everything is on the map. So we are hoping to have that by the end of the week. Uh, and then we would be uh, verifying that through staff and have it up uh, on our website so all of the public can see. And we will also work with uh, communications department when that is completed to send out some information. Councillor Wells. Excellent, thank you. Great, thank That's you. That's everything. Great, thank you, Councillor. Councillor Bodner. All good here, Mr. Mayor, everything's been taken care of. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Baggio. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just two items here. Uh, the first one with the uh, construction going on West Street between Clarence and Princess. Uh, uh, I see that's going along fine, but uh, somebody asked me about when this is completed, will the construction continue from uh, West Street from Clarence to Charlotte? And if so, uh, are there time frames or when construction is supposed to start and when it's supposed to stop, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. CAO. So through your worship to Councillor Bagu, we did uh, receive the same information in our office this afternoon or this morning. Um, the mayor's administrative assistant actually was in contact with the Seaway and they have no plans for other construction outside of the construction area that is uh, north of the intersection of West and Clarence. That project that's taking place there, just for the public's information, I'm sure Councillor Council is generally aware, but for the public, it's not a road resurfacing project. It's actually a seaway asset that's under the road that was in need of repair, structural work to repair it. I think the mayor has a little bit more information about the historical nature of the, of the infrastructure there. It's before my time living or working in Port Colborne, but it's not a simple road repair and there are no plans for the, for the road to be resurfaced in any other area of West Street in the near future, unless Public Works tells me differently. Thank you, Mr. CEO, and you are correct. That's actually a bridge that uh, is located underneath uh, that portion of West Street. Um, it's actually wide open. It was, it was actually formerly a wide open area that was used to move water in and out of the locks when the locks were downtown back in the 20s to early 30s before the new canal was uh, was opened. And um, so there's, a, there's actually a, a bridge there, but I believe they're filling that in and it'll be a solid structure uh, moving forward. So that structure goes back to, as I said, uh, around the late mid to late 1920s. So that's what they're doing. If everybody remembers, there used to be three or two or three tunnels that uh, accessed uh, 
north-south uh, beside the original locks. And they were all used to move water, no different than our Weir Canal does today. So, Councillor Baggio. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, my next one is just an announcement. It's, uh, I'm excited to see that Shobo Theater has plans on reopening back in Port Colburn very soon. I think it's in November. And uh, I'm just wishing them all the best. And uh, if the residents want to find out, I'm sure they can go on the website and very soon, or if not already. And uh, I think there's two shows coming up before between now and Christmas. So it's uh, pretty exciting, Mr. Mayor. We are reopening a little bit over that area of Park Holborn. So I'm looking forward to it, Mr. Mayor. Good. They haven't called on you to do a guest spot, have they, Councillor Baggy? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Great, thank you. Uh, nothing further. Uh, I've got Councillor Wells with his hand up. Uh, was there a question of something that Councillor Baggy brought up? No, a uh, question to, uh, to you, Your Worship. In regards to the um, the seaway work and in, in the channel that goes underneath West Street, that channel actually ran um, all the way from where they're doing the construction up to Charlotte Street uh, at one time. I was wondering, are they going to extend that? You said they're closing it off. Are they going to extend the, the fill uh, of that tunnel way uh, all the way from Charlotte all the way down to um, uh, Park Street? Not that I'm aware of, uh, but we can ask. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we'll ask, but I, that, I mean, there is a portion at um, at Charlotte and and West that, if you look, the the tunnel has been closed. There is one still open to the east, but the West tunnel is closed at this time, uh, right there where you stand near the uh, the Harbor Master Hut. So, I think yeah. this tunnel is actually part of that one infrastructure. And they yes, we, we used to yeah. swim through that when we were kids, <laughs> yeah. uh, swimming in the canal. It used to be one of the uh, challenging swim areas to swim through the dark tunnel. Yes, and I think where the, um, where the parkette is across from the stores on West Street, um, where the trees and everything are, I believe that was filled in when that whole development went in. We can double check with staff, but I believe that, was, that tunnel was filled in back then, uh, part of it. So, But we'll confirm with the seaway and get back to you guys on that. That's great. I'd, I'd hate to see a sinkhole right there in front of, um, okay. uh, in, in front in the corner of Clarence and uh, West Street. <laughs> that yes. wouldn't wouldn't go very well. No, correct, correct. Councilor Clayla, if you had your hand up. Through you, Mr. Mayor, I just I I wanted to respond also to uh, Councilor Bagu's uh, what he had to say about um, Showboat Festival Theater. Actually, I just got an email today, and it's pretty exciting. The uh, ministry told them they could open up and have more people. They, they could increase sales. They have made the decision not to. They have made the decision to stick with what they were going to do. They did go on public sale. I believe today was the first day that you can buy tickets. They have made the decision to keep it to the smaller amount, the venue, two people together with seating in between, just in case things change. And they feel that this is a, a better way to move forward in the beginning until we see how we make out with COVID. So um, you need to get your tickets. But the tickets went on sale publicly, I believe it was either yesterday or today. So, so they're out there and you can get them. And you buy them in blocks of two, I believe, or, or many more that you want. But you, you need to buy, unless they have singles that they can put you together with. But it is very exciting and I know they're very pleased to be able to finally open. Great, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Bruno. Uh, thank you, just real quick. Uh, one item with three locations for uh, Mr. Director Kalamoto. Uh, Chris, this is just regards to some, some of these intersections have come up before on weeds, they may be absentee landlords or um, not being mindful of what actually though is public property. So that would be uh, Neff and King um, along um, King, just through the first property, so about the first 100 feet uh, south of Neff. Second one would be Steel in Maine. That's been done before. That's the old uh, Buckner's Sports on the Steel Street side. And finally, Fielden at Maine along the uh, west side of Fielden for about the first property or two there. If um, Public Works has a chance, if they could uh, uh, get the weed whacker in there or trimmer. Thank you. 
Great. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Demaray. No, I have nothing for tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Borgard. I have no remarks at this time as well. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Okay, on to item 15, consideration of items requiring separate discussion. Go to item 7.1, Lockview Park concept plan. Uh, the recommendations that Chief Administrative Office Report 2021-256 be received. The Council approve the final concept plan for Lockview Park attached as Appendix A to Chief Administrative Office Report 2021-256. I have Councillors Demeray and Wells moving that. Um, I'm going to turn this over to staff because we do have um, uh, Eliza Oprescu, Senior Landscape Architect from MHBC Planning, uh, here with us this evening for a small presentation. Mr. Long, do you want to take over right now for this one? Oh, you're still on mute. No, we can't hear you. He has a weak internet connection. Okay, so before we, we'll just move from Mr. Hong and we'll let uh, Eliza uh, do uh, her presentation. Welcome, Eliza. Thank you, and uh, good evening, uh, Mayor Steele, City Council members, and uh, staff. Um, I'll try to take you through a little bit of the background as well, just uh, since we didn't get Mr. Long to uh, to start the, the conversation, I just want to make sure I am being heard, and we're all good. Perfect. You're perfect. Great. Um, so MH MHBC, I'm, I'm actually a senior landscape architect at MHBC. Um, we're planners, urban designers, landscape architects, uh, and we were retained to um, take all the information that we got from several open houses and stakeholder feedback and consolidated uh, into a plan for Lockview Park. Um, so we came up with two concept plans uh, that was then presented at an open house. Um, of the future of the area in general. And um, what you'll see here is that we've dashed along some lines and provided an opacity with a potential for a future multi-block, uh, as well as uh, several different lots and a parking lot uh, on the corner here. So all of these are projected to, to be supplementary to the park that I will be presenting, but the park was developed with the notion that these will come into play. So a lot of questions or, or comments and concerns came back from the open house and, and stakeholder uh, conversations about things like parking uh, and con overall connections. Um, so just want to point out that this is the future plan. Uh, we're showing something that isn't quite there yet um, in, in this particular vicinity, but what we're working towards. Uh, so what we've done here is we've taken those first few concepts or first couple of concepts that we presented, uh, didn't necessarily show this direction. So we're now coming back with uh, exactly what we're proposing um, with the connections that will hopefully be made in the future uh, as we see them and as we've discussed with uh, Mr. Long and other, other participants. So what we see here is a connection on John Street uh, and the potential future extension uh, going north, um, a potential future multi-black to the north of the park, uh, and a potential future parking lot that will be servicing the park itself uh, and provide for, for some of that accessibility. 
Um, we see the sidewalks continuing on through, through the site and, and making this park quite connected. Uh, but beyond just the sidewalks on, on John Street and beyond, there's a potential to make greater connections to the city as a whole. Uh, we briefly touched on this in the first couple of concepts, but we're coming back here with a look at the park itself and an understanding that this park could be deployed to be connected to very many parts of, of the neighborhood uh, and of the greater city as a whole. So while we're talking about Lockview Park here, it's important to note that there's definite connections that are, are foreseen and that are hopefully planned for in the future. Uh, but for the time being, we're, we're showing um, a great community park uh, that uh, maybe I'll take you on a walk through here. So as we're, we're getting off of John Street here, uh, it'll be our entryway, our park signage, our, our rules. Um, uh, really off the bat, you're welcomed by a couple of garden uh, plots here. So uh, the way that we're going to deploy those and our recommendations include not only um, that it be a city initiative to, to maintain these gardens, uh, but it could be a greater community involvement uh, aspect. So something that we can really involve um, citizens from, from the surrounding area and beyond to, uh, to come in and, and be a part of the planting, be a part of the maintenance, be a part of the, the overall look. Uh, as we're walking along, we'll, we'll see a meandering circuit path, and this is intentional. This is intended to, to provide uh, all park users with somewhere to stroll, to somewhere to people watch, uh, somewhere to sit along the way as well. So it's not just a park meant for children or for teenagers or for any specific age group. We've really aimed at making this a park for, for every citizen. Um, depending, regardless rather of, of what age or what mobility um, is, is taking place. So the pathway meanders through the park. Uh, there's several seating nodes um, that are along the park that people could stop. Uh, some seating nodes that could uh, stop and gaze onto more active uses such as the multi-use court. Uh, which could directly benefit from, um, from a connection to the high school uh, directly south. Uh, and as we walk along, we, we see a sheltered uh, picnic area with uh, bike parking, waste receptacles, uh, adjacent to a playground. Uh, we, we first showed a playground that was a little more uh, refined, but have expanded it since, have included uh, swings, have included uh, a really active a play feature that I will show in, in future slides. Uh, but that's to say that it, it, it still engages ages five to 12 and beyond uh, so that we can make sure that um, you, if you're there with your family and your family consists of multiple age groups that you, you can all have something to do in this park and uh, find something to, to watch. Uh, we have picnic areas set out in, in this particular area, it's uh, underneath large canopy trees. Um, we want to make sure that sight lines are still there, that you can still see through through the canopy and through the underside so there's no sheltered places to hide, except that it's still quite an issue uh, in, in this park um, and something we always consider when we're developing any neighborhood park. So tall headed trees, of course, it'll take some time for them to mature, but, but the future plan is that they would provide shelter and some shading uh, for, for anybody that's using those picnic tables there, whether it's uh, senior citizens uh, sitting and watching the park users or families picnicking uh, in the park. Uh, Lockview Park, careful to, to leave some flexible green space um, it's great to program parks, but it's also great to allow people to be flexible and use the space as, as they see fit. Um, so that these are the major components here. And the next couple of slides here that I'll go through show, um, show these items more specifically and in greater, in greater detail. So we're looking here at the active play that's offered within the park. And this is the, the playground with the different features. Uh, that are associated with it. So multiple um, mobility ranges, multiple age groups can use this, of course, uh, multiple slides uh, and some swings. Um, in addition to a very active uh, multi-use court. 
Uh, this multi-use court allows for basketball, pickleball, tennis to happen uh, with, with some programming, but um, it would definitely be one of the highlights of, of the park. We move along, we move to the more passive activity that can be afforded here. Um, this is in abundance and it includes things like picnicking, sheltered picnicking, the amphitheater that we briefly spoke about here uh, that allows people to gather and, and socialize, the garden beds that are also a gateway feature within the park, uh, and then the flexible open space where dynamic uh, activities or dynamic play can happen. Uh, we're showing here uh, frisbee and yoga in the park and just a simple uh, flying of a kite, but it, all these things are quite valuable in, uh, in any park. And then lastly, um, we're looking at the way that this could become uh, a place where people really want to go, a place where they can stroll and watch activity happen, a place where they can sit. Uh, it's not a one-way street, it's, it's a loop, it's a circuit path on, on purpose. Um, so we'll see that this loops in and out. There's potential for future connections made as well. Uh, again, this, this particular presentation is not looking on how those connections are made and where necessarily they, they're being made to, but the, the possibility for this to expand into something bigger and greater is, is definitely there and it's taken into consideration. Uh, multiple types of seating can be found, whether it's benching, whether it's uh, shaded picnicking, whether it's just a picnic table or this, this amphitheater. This is uh, to, to really cater to all different modes of, of use, uh, different ways to, to use the park and different ways to watch other people use the park as well. So eyes on the park is, is an important feature that we'd like to consider. If the park is used more, uh, it will be less... Um, less attractive to aberrant behavior, uh, more attractive to, to, to families, to citizens, to multiple user groups. Um, so my presentation stops there and I'll stop sharing my screen and I'll say thank you very much for, for giving me that little time to go through this great park. Great, thanks Eliza. Mr. Long, were you, able to picture, were you able to fix your mute? Test one, two, three. There you go. We can hear you now. Go ahead, Gary. Thank you. Thank you to the city clerk. I do appreciate it. Sorry, proceed, uh, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Do you have anything to add to uh, what Eliza was going on with? Uh, no, other than uh, we, we certainly uh, look forward to council comments this evening. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with Eliza and her company. And I also wanted to say that... Uh, Staff uh, really appreciate all of the uh, resident and stakeholder feedback that we've received over the last, I would say, six months. We've had uh, two virtual open houses. We've had two uh, rounds of online surveys. We've had stakeholder meetings with the school board, the Active Transportation Committee, uh, and the Seniors Advisory Committee. So the community uh, and key stakeholders have really been engaged think what is being presented tonight, um, while it's difficult to please everyone, I think really goes a, a, a long way to, um, you know, representing the, the views and the preferences uh, of our community and key stakeholders. We look forward to your comments. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Long. Uh, I'm going to go to my list of speakers. I've Councillor Demery first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you to Mr. Long. Uh, I just I want to thank you for addressing some of the concerns that, that did get expressed through the consultation with the Seniors Advisory Committee and the Active Transportation Committee. Um, I know that they had some concerns and most of those have been taken care of, uh, which, which is good to see. I'm, I'm pleased with the plan overall, and I think that it's going to be a, a great contribution to, to the community. Um, it, is, seem, it seems to be aimed at young, active people. So um, unfortunately for seniors, I was hoping that we would see a set out area away from the playground, but I'm sure that we could in, in the future maybe uh, put a little uh, pavilion or something over in the, around the trees that would be better for them. But I would like to see the words potential and possible and hopeful and future struck from this. I would like to see that we definitely have parking. Potential parking doesn't suit well. Uh, we need to have definite parking and it has to be there where it's, it's, it's an easy access 
for those people with uh, ability issues and with and and who are seniors to be able to get in and out of there easily. I'd also like to see a more clearly defined path to the washrooms and those washrooms made entirely accessible again for the same reasons for the same group of people um this way it, it best suits everyone there are rather minor issues when you look at the laying out of a whole park so um i would just like to see those but otherwise i think this is a great plan um it looks it looks wonderful i really like the idea of having a circuit that people could walk um which is really a great thing and, and a lot of people will enjoy that i look forward to uh speaking at budget time over the next few years uh to get more uh, fitness equipment for seniors into that uh into that park because that's something that we did talk about um anyway i just want to thank you for all your efforts and uh i know that the committees were really happy to uh have been asked for their opinion so i thank you from them as well that's everything great thank you councillor i have councillor wells Thank you, Worship. I have uh, one comment and one question for Elijah. Uh, the comment first off is that I think we need to do a lot more with uh, interconnecting uh, all of our parks and the Friendship Trail. And I, I think that if we could, if we can be a more um, dramatic in regards to doing that, we can get more attention uh, and more use of, of all the parking space, uh, parks that we have and the connection on it and we could even possibly turn those into different events that we could have throughout the year um so i, I would uh, really strongly encourage that we try to connect that park sooner than later uh to to the lockheed park and the uh, uh valet center that was my comment uh, my question to elijah is that a lot of our parks um and i'm going to say all of our parks do not have a winter uh, theme to them. I know in this one here, we look. You're looking at the sod mound as being able, able to be used for sledding or tobogganing on a very small scale. I'm sure. Uh, I was wondering if the court could be used as a rink. Could it possibly be flooded in the winter time, or would that court uh, be susceptible to damage uh, if it were flooded in the winter time? And I know we have climate change and we can't count on the weather and I know all of all of their variabilities there, but uh, if there was an opportunity for us to be able to flood that, even if it was for a couple of weeks uh, and have some local skating on it, I, I think that would be a great uh, winter activity that would help promote our parks. So the question was about the integrity of the uh, uh, the court with regards to freezing on top. Eliza? So through, through the chair, um, I, because the court is asphalt, uh, it, it might see some damage, but I don't see why we would not be able to set something up uh, even on the sod. Some of the skating trails and, and things like that that have been a part of have been on concrete, uh, but that would be an excellent suggestion to, to look into uh, as this gets developed. And I think something easily implementable uh, in this location. Councillor? That's, that was my idea, thank you. Great, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Bruno. Uh, thank you, Worship. Um, I recall um, talking to the CAO and, uh, about sort of all the projects that we undertake where we, we sort of, um, we focus in on what we really want and yet we don't really look potentially at the bigger picture or a whole of space concept. And so I did have some conversation um, with, um, uh, with uh, Steve Schapowski on one of the things in this layout, I certainly um, love the layout and I certainly wanna get on with this park as soon as possible and put the most uh, emphasis and dollars in that we can and get it rolling. But one of the things is, I don't think we've looked, we've looked in isolation at the park, and yet we denote an area north of the current plan and speak to it about future development. It's been mentioned both in emails and in reports about potential for residential, some of which I would love to see how it incorporates or intersects with the park, as well as what the potential um, type of housing and the marketability of that housing and the proceeds from that potential housing. And so to that end, I, I, I would like to do, uh, refer this 
to, um, I mean, we're months away from doing this for a couple of weeks to engineering. And just look at the whole profile of then the housing component and services, access to them, um, gravity feed, um, current services to hook up to, and how that incorporates with the um, with the industry that's there, the former uh, uh, Algoma uh, plant there and its cleanup and those rear fence areas. So I'm wondering if we could refer this to engineering for a whole discussion about servicing and on the whole site, including potentially a residential component. And uh, I'm not in a hurry for that, but I would suggest two to four weeks. And I wonder if I could get a seconder on that. Thank you. Can I get a seconder to the referral? Councillor Bagu. Okay, there is no debate on referral. So, Mr. Kalamudu, with regards to it coming back to Council with this report, uh, can you, so we can put a timeline on this? I think Councillor Bruno has uh, put in, as far as a referral, the ask of information to come back from your department. Can you give us a, a more of a definite timeline? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, <clears throat> we'd have to take a look. We haven't done any of those uh, examinations as of yet obviously and um we'd also have to take a look to see what type of um development is happening and without um i'm sorry i'm not sure about the, the secondary plan within that area or what uh, the official plan has to say because that would then uh determine the type of building so um unfortunately without that uh, the, without that knowledge again i i'm might play the new guy card here, but not <laughs> not knowing the uh, the OP and the secondary plan and what is uh, expected to be built in that area, it might take a little bit longer to identify what type of infrastructure is needed. However, there are certain things with regard to connectivity, um, with regard to where the pipes actually are, and uh, and if they can hold. Again, all of that would be part of the infrastructure needs study that is currently out for bid uh, as we speak. So if that uh, information is known, we could then uh, put it into the INS uh, studies uh, for the engineers to take a look at and identify if there are any restrictions within the current assets or not. Okay, Councillor Bruno? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that, using the current assets and perhaps talking to planning is, you know, what's currently in our OP and what the potential is. I just want to maximize the best value for both the citizens, the park, um, and to give it a, uh, a good launch in the right place with the right funding. Okay, thank you, Councillor. There is no debate on a referral. Uh, Mr. Kalamoto, so you understand what uh, the Councillor is asking for. Um, and Mr. Long, you're understanding what the Councillor is asking for so that uh, when this comes back, you'll have those questions answered. In the meantime, if councillors do have other questions, they can forward them to Mr. Kalamoto and Mr. Long. Uh, with that being said, we have a mover and a seconder. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Opposed? Okay, that will be carried. That item is referred. Item 7.2. Recommendation that Corporate Services Department Report 2021-263 be received for information and that the recommenda recommended transfer to the working capital reserve of $129,400 and the building condition audit of all city buildings for $75,000 be approved. I have Councillors Bruno and Wells moving that. I'm going to go to Councillor Bruno. Uh, thank you, Worship, and thank you, Mr. Bowles, for another excellent job. I taking us forward. I know this isn't the end game on these trimester reports. I appreciate the crystal balling as to how uh, the year might end. Um, a lot of questions uh, answered in the last few weeks while we did budget and the proposals um, and questions that I've asked you um, independently. I think the two areas that um, I, I wanted to highlight and perhaps get you to comment on is um, both the um, both the marina and the um, uh, well why don't, I, why don't I start with the marina um, 
I, I just, you know, we had a great year there. And yet one can see that um, had we not, we could have easily slipped into deficit. And that's because of, of um, I think, the, the coming review that you're going to do on fees and things like that. I just find that uh, the other one was building permit. I just, I just find that we come into the end of the year and we sort of have a couple Hail Marys um, that we didn't anticipate. And the cavalry came roaring in and we had this one um, excessive building that sort of saved the day in the SSE called the building department. And in the marina, we had a record attendance. Yet if you look at the dollars amount left uh, as a surplus for the marina, it's tiny. And so I'm, I'm wanting to see perhaps um, a more fulsome plan um, and I'm not sure, so this is the question is the logistics of you being able to put in the operating budget next year for two of the SSE, A being Marina, B being the building permit department. Do you think you're going to be able to A, pay for and get the building permit uh, consultant done so that fees can start for the 1st of January so that your budget will be realistic with a fee adjustment if needed? So that's a timing issue and cost issue. And on the marina, that those fees will present a picture that we don't have to count on a perfect marina year for seasonal slips and no surprise expenses. So I'm wondering if you can address the timing issue on those two. Mr. Bowles? Yeah, through, through the mayor to the councilor and council. So I guess first to the marina, um, the councillor is correct that we are we are forecasting right now a small transfer to the reserve of three thousand dollars, and and when you consider that the marina um, total program is about one point three million, that three thousand dollars is a very small margin of error uh, going forward, and I think that is one of the reasons that when you when you see the budget that's going to come out in the next week um, for your consideration. We will be looking at increasing the marina fees again, not just for uh, capital, but also because we need to create a bit of a, a bit of a buffer should something go wrong at the marina. And there are a number of things that could go wrong at any point in time. And the second is on, on building uh, permits. You know, I appreciate the question. And what we've done right now is, is and I, we identify in the report, as you point out, we did have, uh, the city did have a large, uh, I guess, project that came forward and the fees there were enough to prevent it from having to utilize some of its reserve to kind of skate by this year and make its budget requirements. And uh, we have pointed out that we'd like to do a fee reserve and for a fee review. And as part of this document, we've tried to highlight that uh, we've forecasted to start that fee review now. And our goal would be to have that back to you at the beginning of the year. So when we bring about the budget in a couple of weeks, uh, we'll show revenue and expenses in the uh, building inspections department as balanced. And we'll be looking to bring back the fee report to council in the very beginning of, uh, by the very beginning of 2022. Um, so that way we could implement the fees and meet our balanced budget requirement. Um, the building department does have a small reserve and we are projecting it to have a small reserve of about $80,000 at the end of the year. So there is a little bit to carry it for the first couple months should we not get the fees done in the first month. But, but to council, just for clarity, but when we forecasted that budget here, um, we forecasted doing that, re that fee um, review right now and the chief building officer is uh, is ready to uh, work on that. And I know our um, acting director um, is 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 well on board to, to work on this project as well. And we appreciate um, that leadership. Councilor. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Director Bull. So with that, we could be looking at not having to depend on these um, white knights to come rescue um, the building department at the end. That said, um, crystal balling it, I, I, I've, I am under the understanding that we have some of the lowest fees in the Niagara region 
Would would you know that at all? Mr. Falls? Yeah, through uh, the councillor to uh, through the mayor and to the councillor and, and council, that is correct. Uh, some of the original or initial work we've done on both development fees and uh, building permit fees is our fees are substantially lower than other areas. And what we started talking about in the 2022 capital budget is our proposal and recommendation of staff. And I know uh, my colleague, the director of public works has the same view as well as the, the other senior staff of the city is that it's appropriate for growth to pay for growth and us not to put those costs on the current tax base. And that's what we wanna do these um, reviews and bring them back to council. And this review, just for clarity, would be done with um, development uh, or building permit funds. So it's not like the levy is doing this. This it's it's being it's being paid for by building permit fees themselves. Okay. Great. Awesome. Thank you. So would it be fair to say that uh, now would be a good time to go and get a permit um, before <laughs> January first? <laughs> and through the mayor, I think if that's rhetorical, I'm not. I'm yeah. not sure, but I think the answer is well known. Yeah. Councilor, Thank you, Mr. Bowles. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Wells. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, uh, good job on this, uh, Brian. I, I really like the the format that's coming across, and I'm getting more familiar with it every every time I, I get a look at it. Uh, question, um, and I'm not sure whether you could. Uh, respond to this or um, but um, I have uh, some concerns in regards to our capital spend um, we have a significant amount that has not been uh, spent throughout the year uh, that we're going into 2022 with and I do appreciate and understand uh, uh, that a number of these capital projects are multi-year projects um, but uh, it still leaves me with a concern that we will not be able to hit the spend on these capital projects or get these capital projects kicked off uh, or have delays in future year projects that we're looking at. Can, can you make any comments on that? Mr. Bowles? And through the mayor to the councillor and council and, and maybe the director of public works would like to, to speak to some um, I, I think you're referring to Appendix D, and in Appendix D, we, we highlight um, that we started the year with about $10 million in capital projects, and um, some of the projects we've closed out and recommended through the 2022 budget process to repurpose the funds. Um, we do anticipate that we'll have about $3.5 million in capital projects carrying over to the next year. And uh, some of those, uh, some dollars that were originally planned to be spent this year, we, ha we have moved into the 2022 capital budget. And as council's aware, that budget was almost $20 million. So there's a lot of capital on, our, uh, on the books to do within the city and a lot of exciting projects. And I appreciate the councilor pointing out that some of the projects are uh, definitely multi-year uh, projects. Um, but as, with respect to some of the timing, I, I know we did point out in the capital budget some of the projects like the dates. Um, going forward, uh, finance has looked at maybe allocating uh, the dollars by year so we could show you a, or create another appendix for you to show what our planned spend is by year instead of just the totality. Um, but when it comes to actually the completion of the capital projects, two things have happened recently at the city and, and council did approve for our temporary support and the purchasing um, department to add a, add a resources temporarily, as well as to add a resource with respect to uh, some project management to get some projects off the go. And at that point in time, I need to pass it over to my colleague, the director of public works at Maywash to add any other color or comments with respect to the, uh, the capital program that I know he's trying to tackle. <laughs> Mr. Kalamoto. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to the Councillor. <clears throat> yes, uh, Director Bowles uh, did put uh, two of those variables uh, that he spoke about, the procurement assistance and the project management assistance that will help us. That was only put um, together just, uh, just a couple months ago. So we have now started uh, moving a little bit more quickly on the projects. Unfortunately, we still do not have our uh, manager of engineering as of yet. Uh, that would, that uh, resource that will be put in place hopefully soon uh, should also help us uh, get uh, expedite some of those projects. The other thing is uh, the projects that were noted are uh, larger projects. 
So again, they are maybe one project, but just a larger dollar figure than uh, in, in the past. So they aren't as many as uh, a multitude of different projects, but they are just larger projects uh, with the lar larger dollar figure. Again, uh, there is, I wouldn't really call it an efficiency, but even smaller projects still have a number of steps to go through. And the larger steps, even though there might be a slightly, um, slightly more uh, hoops to jump through, it's not um, doubling uh, the amount uh, when it comes to the amount of steps and the amount of cost of a project. Uh, so again, logistically, dealing with the larger projects aren't um, that much uh, more work than dealing with the smaller projects. So therefore, we, can be, we should be able to um, hammer some of those out a little bit more quickly. Council should see uh, some advancement in certain projects uh, just in the second half of the year and into the new year. Some other efficiencies with regard to signing off of uh, certain capital projects by uh, the CAO and the director have also improved some of the deficiency, uh, some of the efficiencies. And uh, we will be coming uh, forward with council to talk about additional more uh, about uh, efficiencies that staff are recommending with regard to procurement. So with all of those uh, different variables in place uh, and the fact that some staff are now getting settled within uh, engineering and public works, as we did have almost a 50% turnover in the past uh, 14 months. Now that uh, some of those are in place, we should see some of those projects starting to move a little bit more quickly than in the past. Thank you, Director. Councillor Wells? Thank you. Um, I just, um, good luck on spending it all. And uh, um, uh, I know it's a lot of work, uh, so keep on it. Thank you. Great, thank you, Councillor. Any further questions? Seeing none, all in favor, please raise your hand. And that's carried. Item 7.3. The Chief, the Chief Administrative Office Report 2021-257 be received and the Council approve the new concept plan for the Parkhead at HH Knoll Lakeview Park, attached as Appendix A to Chief Administrative Office Report 2021-257. I have Councillors Bruno and Baggy moving this. <coughs> Councillor Bruno. I thank your Worship, uh, fully supportive of that Parkhead moving forward. Like the idea that there were four designs number of comments in the survey. I think when they boiled it down to the final one, they um, took a lot of option four and, and tweaked some from some others. So in general principle, I like it. Um, I like the fact that uh, um, I think they removed some traffic hazards there um, um, at the entrance. The, the two questions I have, uh, one, with respect to the uh, surround that is planter boxes versus another option, which is sort of the wrought iron fencing. I was really mostly concerned about um, the ongoing maintenance and the longevity of it. You know, like if it's if it's plastic wood and all those kind of things, and it's there's not you know clean up to do every day, then that's great. Otherwise, I like the rail on the uh, shade tensile element. I just like it, just concern myself about the quality of the build down there and what kind of warranty there is. I don't know if those can be addressed tonight. Uh, again, I'm just worried about ongoing maintenance and the strength of the shading element. Mr. Long? you uh, your worship to the councillor I can follow up uh, uh, with a consultant uh, who's had some conversations with the uh, provider of the shade just to get a bit more information on warranty and strength and durability we can certainly share the councillor's uh, concerns uh, about that um, I think on the issue of, of maintenance uh, I know it's important to council and staff that uh, Try and have materials, use materials, uh, you know, that are that are you know as close to maintenance free as as possible. I know in speaking with uh, our supervisor of parks, you know, he's very supportive of what's being proposed, but he did make the comment that uh, you know, they, they 
certainly are very supportive of anything that would be maintenance free and would, would uh, ensure that their staff are not spending a lot of time on that site at the expense of other parks that, that need their time as well. So um, I appreciate the, the councillor's comments on that. Thank you. Just one last point I, I forgot to bring up is we had a lot of discussion last fall or, or last spring, I should say, about bringing in the vendors there. I like the placement look at it. Just want to know that what's incorporated in there is that those, whether they be food trucks or trailers, have a proper way in and out that doesn't involve going into the grass and gouging that, and that things like propane tanks and all. I actually did have a power outage in this neighborhood earlier, so we're. You still have it? Okay. So we're. Okay, we're back to streaming. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Long. Uh, through you, uh, Your Worship, to, to Council. Yeah, we, we appreciate uh, the Councillor's comments. We, we share his concerns. We have the same uh, dreams and aspirations that, uh, that he does and the community has for the, uh, the aesthetics uh, of this site, the accessibility of this site. So uh, we will ensure that, uh, you know, that the final design um, and, and the reality of it uh, reflects uh, you know, the comments that he's made. I had a conversation earlier today with my colleague, Luke Rowe, who is uh, on, online this evening. Luke has been very helpful on this project. And uh, we had the same conversation, which follows up on a conversation I had with Councillor Bruno uh, late last week about aesthetics and access. So um, yeah, we, we're very supportive of those comments. and. Uh, uh, look forward to moving forward with the project. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mr. Long. Councillor Baggy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess I want to talk about aesthetics also. Uh, in the summary, it stated that the city may look for a sponsorship, a partnership with uh, opportunities, local businesses, you know, for chairs or tables or whatever, planters or lighting. Basically, for the aesthetics, I just don't want to see it look like Humberson Speedway when they drive by. You see these big four by six signs or bigger signs than that advertising some businesses. Like the ambiance there is quite nice right now, as in the marina also. The signs are very minimal at the marina, if 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 any. And the lawn trap, which is really, really good. People have to stand there 10 minutes reading signs of different uh, places. So uh, we keep that in mind. I'm all for the sponsorship of local businesses, but uh, appreciate it. That's all, Mr. Mayor. Great. Thank you, Councillor. Just one second, Council. Yeah, we are under generator power counselor, so we are having a few issues. I'm sorry if I broke it, Mr. Mayor.
lose it again? Some of you, okay, you're all moving now. Raise your hands if you're in favor. And that's carried. Thank you, Council. I apologize for these. Okay, we're on to correspondence items. I, item 8.1 is a letter from the Town of Fort Erie requesting the province, provincial government to implement a rite of passage along the Lake Erie shoreline. I have Councillor Wells bringing that up. Councillor Wells? Thank you, Worship. Um, it's a comment in regards to that. Over my short term here as councillor, I've, I've run into a number of situations where um, property owners that have water lots, which extend down into the water, um, have concerns in regards to passages of people on their lake, on their waterfront. Not so much from the, the fact that they don't want them there, it's just from the fact that um, human nature or bad human nature is that uh, there is a lack of respect for some of those properties. And um, I feel that a, a, a movement on this regard is virtually just permitting um, uh, or pro, uh, permitting trespassing on private properties. And if, it, if it's not the waterfront, then where does it go? Does it go to the woodlot? Then where does it go from there? So I, I think that we have to be very uh, careful on what this is implying and that it could be a slippery slope that could lead us to some very um, contentious property issues. Um, and uh, so I am, uh, my comment is that uh, I'm not in favor of doing this. I don't think it's a, a right of any tier of government to allow trespassing on private property. Um, so I, uh, I am not in support of this, uh, this letter. Great, thank you, Councillor. So you can do one of two things. We can just receive this or we can uh, move that we do not uh, agree with the letter from Fort Erie and then send them a letter based on that through the clerk's office. Do you want to proceed with that? I, I'd like to make a motion that we receive it and leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Seconder for that. Councillor Bruno. Oh, we're frozen again. Oh, there we are. We're back. Okay, motion to uh, receive only. Any questions? All in favor, please raise your hand. That's carried. Thank you, Councillor. Item 8.2 is a letter from the uh, City of Sarnia regarding reno evictions. Uh, Councillor Demaray. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would like to receive this uh, and move it from receiving it to supporting it and uh, circulating it to the regular recipients. Great, thank you, Councillor, and I'll take that as a motion. I just will read, it's very short here, that the Sarnia City Council requests that the Government of Ontario take additional and meaningful steps to address the ever-increasing problem of reno evictions in the province of Ontario. Citizens and communities are hurt by these unscrupulous practices, which can and does directly impact the affordable housing crisis, as well as inflict damage, both financially and mentally, particularly on our most vulnerable citizens, and that this correspondence also be sent to other municipalities in Ontario for their consideration and possible endorsement. Can I get a seconder to that uh, motion? Uh, Councillor Bruno, and may I add, uh, Councillor, that we send this to um, the uh, Honorable Doug Downey, Attorney General, and uh, our MPPs in the Niagara region um, in regarding to supporting that. Is that all right? Okay, any yes. questions? Councillor Beauregard. Through your worship uh, to Council, uh, it's my understanding that the Residential Tenancies Act has undergone a lot of changes, in particular to address rent evictions um, and a lot of other means to evict tenants. So I'm not necessarily sure that this is necessarily required, as there is all there, the province is already well aware and is taking action on it. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Any further questions? All those in favor, please raise your hand. And that's carried. Item 8.3 is a letter from the region of Niagara regarding CAO 15-2021 updated land acknowledgement statements. Councillor Denemary. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, 
this is something I, I actually ask that we uh, put a land acknowledgement together and as part of our, our uh, regular procedures uh, quite some time back and the clerk was working on it. Uh, possibly I could put this over to the clerk right now and ask uh, what the status of that request is. Madam Clerk. Thank you, through the chair. Um, so Councilor Demre, I recognize this has been a priority of yours for some time. You, uh, we talked about it over a year ago and I uh, promised to put it in the procedural bylaw update, uh, but that update is not yet complete. Um, so because it's not yet complete, uh, we are still able to go forward with the land acknowledgement uh, now tonight if you would like, uh, and I'll formally put it in that bylaw change when it happens. Uh, so if you do want to move forward with it, I just ask that you uh, pass this motion in support of the region's report and also include uh, amendment to the procedural bylaw to include a land acknowledgement in our agenda. Councillor, you're okay thank with that? Yes, thank you very much. That's exactly what I would like to do. Great, thank you, Councillor. I'll have you move that. Can I get a seconder? Councillor Bodner. So just uh, with regards to this, the region has worked on this. They have um, uh, worked with our native community uh, within Niagara as well as other groups to put together actually two versions, a short version and a long version. Uh, and in speaking with the clerk today, other clerks departments across Niagara have been working on this. So uh, we can implement this and begin at our next meeting if uh, this passes this evening. So I have a mover and a seconder. Questions, Councillor Baggett. Uh Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just for information, the library board of directors had a meeting recently within the last week and they passed a land recognition statement to be uh, done at the library board, Mr. Mayor. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Baggett. Councillor Beauregard. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Through you, uh, maybe for some clarification, will this land acknowledgement be only in for like council purposes, or will this also be like any, any event that you attend in Port Colburn, would that be like a statement that is made at the beginning as well? Madam Clerk. Um, this motion uh, stipulates a change in the procedural bylaw, so it will be during council. Uh, when we single Canada, we will also do the land acknowledgement. Okay, Councillor. Okay, thank you. Yeah, right now the MPCA, which I serve on, uh, does this, and as well as Chair of the Police Services Board, we do have a, our own land acknowledgement, uh, which we uh, say at the beginning of each meeting. So we'll follow uh, what other municipalities. And the reason the Niagara region took this on is, is have one set of plans in that plan and in that document. Um, I tried to find them. Uh, I went to the region's website, couldn't find them there. I went to our website, couldn't find it there. I went to Portland Quarry's website and couldn't find it there. Um, I did communicate with uh, um, with Amber and uh, and she had said that um, uh, it's possible that uh, we might have those on file. Um, I'm just ask uh, through you to Amber if we if she could confirm that we have those two documents, and if possible, maybe reach out to um, Port Gordon Quarries to have them put it on their website so that anybody interested in seeing what those documents are could uh, access them. Okay, Madam Clerk, who is also acting director of planning. Uh, through the chair. Uh, since our discussion this afternoon, I have not been able to confirm, uh, but I do believe they're public documents, and if so, I'll make sure they are up somewhere the public can access them easily. Councillor? That's great. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor. And can I have you move that we receive this? Is that fine? Yes. Mm -hmm. Councillor Bodner, would you second that? Thank you. Any further questions? Councillor Bruno? No? Okay, thank you. Seeing no further questions, all those in favor to receive, please raise your hand. That's carried. 8.5 is a letter from the region of Niagara. Consultation response and further policy development of, on the Niagara Region Official Plan, PDS 36-2021. Councillor Wells. Thank you, Worship. Um, again, in reviewing this, the uh, what was provided to us by the region, uh, they provide a section on there where they show all the comments that they received uh, in the nature. And uh, the only one from Port Coburn was from a resident, Jack Alinga. Um, and uh, to me, it seemed a little bit um, um, odd that uh, 
all the other communities, all the municipalities um, had provided comments in regards to uh, this, this report, but uh, Port Coburn had not. Um, so I was just wondering if um, through you to Amber, if uh, she could confirm whether we have had discussions with them and maybe uh, somehow um, get what comments we have in regards to the report uh, out in the public. Certainly, Madam Clerk, who's Acting Director of Planning. Uh, through the Chair, uh, yes, the municipality did comment. Uh, we were disappointed to see that they were not included in the report, uh, and I think that was just a miscommunication about how we submitted our comments, uh, but they did get to staff, uh, as we discussed in uh, when planning staff came to Council last meeting. Uh, we will circulate those comments so you can see them as well. Uh, and. Uh, note that the mayor and myself and planning staff will be meeting with the Commissioner of Planning and Development at the region in the upcoming weeks to discuss uh, those items, those concerns discussed at Council at the last meeting. Councillor? Excellent. That's, uh, sometimes we get uh, our efforts get hidden and it's, it's good to make sure everybody sees what we are doing. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor. If I can have you move to receive, seconded by Councillor Demaray. Councillor Demaray is all right with that. Any further questions? All those in favor, please raise your hand. That's carried. Okay. Motions have been passed. Notices of a motion. Council, I have a notice of motion that's come to my attention with regards to our OP change that took place in 2016 and zoning uh, change in 2018. Um, under the Westwood Estate subdivision, there was a lot that was changed from R3 uh, to R1, which it was part of their townhouse um, uh, area that they're that they're planning to build. This is a plan of subdivision that was fully passed by planning staff and council of the day. Uh, this is an oversight uh, based on my conversation with with staff. Uh, that we just changed one lot in that whole uh, subdivision and uh, the uh, proponent Lester Schultz Limited is trying to get that townhouse um, development up which is quite frankly the remaining part of the uh, subdivision before he moves on to the last phase. So we need to do a, an OP and zoning change. Um, it was our mistake. It was never asked for by the proponent. I don't know why we would do it when the subdivision plan was already passed. Uh, but I, I'm bringing a notice of motion and I'll deal with the two uh, ward councillors for a full motion to come forward at next council. Okay. Uh, minutes of boards and committees. Uh, bah, 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 bah. We have the minutes of the Environmental Advisory Committee from December the 9th, 2020. If I can have councillors beg you and Bodner move that. Uh, any questions to those minutes? Seeing none, all in favor? That is carried. Bylaws, this evening council, we have bylaws 19.1 and 19.2. I'm gonna have councillors Kalaleff and, and uh, Beauregard move those. Are there any questions on those two bylaws? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. That's carried. Ladies and gentlemen, that ends our meeting. Thank you, and we thank everybody for watching from home, and we are now adjourned.